There's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, Speaker of Parliament Abba Sumana, Kinsford Bagwin, breaks silence after the Supreme Court suspended his declaration of four parliamentary seats vacant. And there's been a lot of conversation ahead of tomorrow, which has been described as a period where you would have what has been described uh, as a parliamentary showdown ahead of tomorrow's uh, parliamentary sitting, which many are looking forward to um, with, with bated breath, and rightly so, especially because of the conversation and all the issues that have been uh, talked about preceding tomorrow. Good. This, before that declaration by the Speaker of Parliament, this was how the composition of Parliament was like. 137, 137, with an independent candidate who had decided to do business with the, ND, N, the NPP. Now, this independent candidate, second deputy speaker of parliament, decides that's going to contest on the ticket of the MPP and also the three other members of parliament, city MPs, decided to go independent. Triggered Arun Idrisu then to petition the speaker. The speaker went through a reasoned ruling after 48 hours and communicated his decision to parliament. The NPP lost that majority after that declaration and this is how the situation became after the speaker's recent ruling was declared and communicated last week, Thursday. The NDC now assumed the majority in this eighth parliament, 136 against the NPP's 135. And now the MPP wouldn't sit and accept this. They went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court took a decision communicating that the speaker's decision should be stayed. That's the situation right now. But tomorrow, Parliament resumes. And already the two sides have given us indication of what they are going to tomorrow's sitting to do. Alexander Penyomakin spoke to journalists on Friday after the Supreme Court ruling. And this is what he said. This is MPP. The founders of our tradition use the courts to do full right. And true to it, we are Democrats. We don't believe in violence. We don't believe in mischief and unnecessary political chaos. We came to court believing that the court will do right. And indeed, the court has just done that. The rights of those MPs have been reinforced, as well as the rights of those constituents who elected them. For the NDC caucus in Parliament, yesterday they addressed the press Sunday afternoon, clearly giving indication that they are not backing down on their newly as it were, recognized position of majority in Parliament, already giving indication of what they are going to use their new majority status for to have the e-levy and the betting tax abolished. Remember that those two taxes are, are, are political promises now, both the MPP and the NDC, and in fact, Alan Chamanting and all the others have made promise that they are going to abolish the e-levy and the betting tax if they win this 2024 December 7 presidential election. So the NDC caucus in parliament have given indication this is what you're going to do. And Dr. Kessel Lato forcing yesterday in addressing the media didn't make his words on this. Take a look. The NDC now constitute the majority caucus in this eighth parliament. We will jealously protect our new majority status and will not bow, retreat, nor surrender our lovely end status. We will also not abdicate our responsibility to the people of Ghana, no matter what. We are fortified that the proceedings of parliament shall not be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of parliament. So, two sides, they hold on to that position that they are both a majority in this eighth parliament, unprecedented in our parliamentary history in this country. We're going into tomorrow's sitting in parliament, not as a normal Tuesday sitting, but one to watch and watch closely. But ahead of that, the Speaker of Parliament has also given an indication of his mindset, in fact, going into tomorrow, because 
according to the NDC caucus, they are only going to respond to the direction and communication of the Speaker of Parliament. And he's, he's the man to watch tomorrow. And this is what he put out earlier today. God bless our homeland Ghana and make it great and strong beyond any single individual or institution. That is the Speaker of Parliament. He put out just these two. In fact, it's a straight sentence, as a matter of fact, earlier today. Clearly captures his disposition, his mindset, his focus going into tomorrow. God bless our homeland, Ghana. Make it great and strong beyond any single individual or institution. And that's Alban Sumanakis from Bagwin, the Speaker of Parliament, right there. Professor Bafaj Mendia is a governance expert, a former senior advisor on governance to the United Nations. Joining us on Zoom, Professor Bafaj Mendia, this, this straight sentence from the Speaker, obviously, is one that from the governance perspective, you'll subscribe to, is it not? Uh, certainly, it portends a kind of uh, ominous uh, situation tomorrow. It doesn't give me any sense of hope that there's going to be some compromise or any consensus towards uh, avoiding any serious confrontation within our governance structure. Uh, and I think uh, in addition to the speaker's uh, statement, there have been other statements by our friends in the NDC, and of course, some from the NDP too. So all seem to indicate that tomorrow, if you are not careful, and as the speaker says, God forgot to bless this homeland of ours, we might witness a sad day. Not necessarily uh, violence and killings or anything of the sort, but a sad day in terms of how our democracy may come to a screeching halt. You know, effective governance requires a, a full cooperation of all branches of government. Here I'm referring to the three apex arms of government, uh, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. So whenever there's a serious confrontation between or amongst these institutions, uh, democracy suffers. And I think what we have built together as a nation, as a people, for these almost 32 years in this republic, we must find a way to safeguard it. There is no need for any reversal. So what I would suggest strongly is that uh, it may not be too late for some wise men in the country to rise up and find a way to moderate what could be a very sad day tomorrow. I feel you talk about... Uh, it, it not being too late for, for some wise men in this country to rise up and speak. There are some who have even called on the Council of State to have at least by now reached out to these two sides to, yeah. to counsel them because that's part of their mandate, is it not? It is indeed. And even beyond the Council of State. Of course, I've heard this evening that the Peace Council has made some initiatives. But you know, most of uh, our uh, initiatives uh, are already uh, are prejudged by those who do not agree uh, with them for this or other reason. So I think uh, it's important for private diplomacy to be initiated. And I believe strongly that all of us, including those who are aggrieved and those who are angling for all kinds of things, they are, we are all aware that the supreme interest of this country is a, a peaceful one. Uh, the well-being of this country, the people, can be uh, achieved uh, through peace. And I believe all of us are committed to that. So if we can take that as the, uh, as the national interest at this point, I think it may help for people to perhaps moderate their sentiments. At the moment, I think uh, uh, most of us uh, are kind of drowned in uh, sentiments and emotions and therefore mm -hmm. are not uh, seeing reason to find a way to accommodate each other. A wise man once said that uh, uh, war breaks out when people cease to reason. <laughs> Any word that breaks out simply suggests that those combatants simply could not uh, reason. That's why war breaks out. So in the same way, I believe that uh, if uh, someone can inter intervene, uh, for cool heads to prevail, perhaps we may avoid the sad day that I'm referring to as being tomorrow.
uh, a private diplomacy, and obviously meaning that someone outside of the of the of the state or constitutional architecture that we have, for instance, because uh, you know you would have the, those who hold the view that the composition and the appointment process of the members of the Council of State even makes it too difficult for them to even have these persons reach a compromise. Would you agree with that? Uh, precisely, precisely. You see, there's no state institution that is regarded as truly independent or neutral. And it's all because of the uh, system we have created for ourselves, the appointment system. Anyone made president of this country immediately uh, is going to appoint not less than 7,000 people, including all the heads of state agencies and many other things, uh, DCs and all. So that structure that we have in itself creates this uh, uh, perception of uh, bias or perception of uh, one person or an individual institution being under the wings of a, a sitting president. This is not new. We see that all the time. But perhaps this time around, I think uh, the perception is much stronger because I think the sitting president has not helped himself in the country by avoiding certain tendencies. Uh, people seem that oftentimes appointments are uh, may, maybe not based on merit, but on loyalty and those kind of things. So that perception is quite strong. And the recent addition of more judges to the Supreme Court tend to, uh, you know, uh, tends to indicate to people that again the president deliberately packed the court. So there are all these perceptions, but I think after all is said and done, the supreme interest of the nation should be the concern of all of us, all of us. And I think also that this conversation reminds us that we need to really question uh, the practice democracy that we have imposed on ourselves. I'm used to saying that there's a two sides of democracy. The, the principal democracy referring to the values and the rights, freedoms, that all of us value as human beings is different from practicing uh, the, those uh, values. In every country, people have the right to structure the practice based on their own history and culture. You see, we have imposed on ourselves what is strictly a competitive adversarial democracy. We, I don't know why we thought that would be the best for us, because maybe we see it being practiced in the Western countries. But their culture maybe support that. But here, I don't see that. I'm not surprised, by the way, for what is happening, because all along, I knew it would come to a point where these conflicts, uh, confrontations, and threats of uh, destabilizing the democratic process will emerge. Because look, if you take into account what we all call the winner takes all system that we have, right. that if you're a party and you win 51%, the 49%, but, uh, those who want 49 will have to be sidelined for four years, eight years. And unfortunately for us in Ghana, most, almost all our politicians are professional politicians. I, I don't know if they have any life besides politics. So if somebody goes into this for four years and is sidelined for four years, another four years, eight years, then you can understand why people will be desperate to clinch to winning by all means. Mm -hmm. So in the past one, you hear uh, all die, be die, or uh, good for booth, or whatever that we call it. It's all because of this attachment to political power, without which most of us perhaps will not make a living. And that is the reality, because mm. people are going to this system. In fact, uh, like a wise man said some time ago in Nigeria, uh, the most lucrative jobs in Africa today uh, is uh, the religious industry and the political industry. Politics has become industry. It shouldn't be that way. So these uh, problems that we are having, I'm, I'm afraid it will be repeated, is simply telling us that perhaps we need to revise our laws and find a kind of a system that is all inclusive. People mentioned proportional representation. Maybe right. that's the answer. You see, so I think it's time for us, after we go through this, to seriously consider how we redesign our politics to avoid these uh, extremities that we are experiencing. I do appreciate your, your prescriptions and the solutions to uh, your proposals to the situation as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bafu Ajimendia.
Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. He's a governance expert, uh, a former senior governance advisor to uh, the United Nations, joining us here on Ghana tonight. And in fact, a number of you have been asking, who, who are these wise men? You hear Professor Abafaj Mendia talk about there some wise men in this country. Some wise men should rise up by now and, and start talking to these people. Um, I mean, on both sides of, of the House, the MPP and the NDC. He proposes private diplomacy. The number of you appointed to the Council of State as being made up of what you would expect to be the constitutionally defined wise men to counsel. This is it. And you're not wrong, in fact, if you, if you think of, of that, because we are paying them to, to do their job, right? And these are their functions, essentially. Counseling the president and various arms of government on all matters of national interest. Also, consider nominations for appointment. And, and take a look at the, 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 the fourth one. Uh, regular engagement with key public officials on policy and management and operation, operational matters. Promote linkages, coordination, and synergy among sector ministers, departments, and agencies. Examine and monitor. And you would flip to the last one. Mediation and, uh, and conflict resolution. Mediation and conflict resolution to ensure national peace and harmony. That's one of the major functions of the Council of State. Mediation and conflict resolution to ensure national peace and harmony in government. Right? So this, this presents it. But as we speak, there's really no records uh, uh, as yet of whether they have performed this function of doing their bit to ensure that some wise men begin to speak as we are talking about now, or Professor Bafford Mendia is talking about. But coming up next, talking about interventions and the bodies that are supposed to be speaking. The National Peace Council has engaged both sides of parliament in an attempt to avert any potential chaos in the chamber tomorrow following what many expect to be another showdown. To what extent can this help the seeming inflamed situation that we're, we're dealing with right now. And Sheikh Army Al Shaibo, who, um, in, in what seems to be a proactive move, the, the National Peace Council convened an emergency meeting ahead of what is expected to be a relatively tense parliamentary session tomorrow. The aim of this meeting, as we understand, is to prevent any chaotic scenes in the House tomorrow uh, because this parliament is not shy of those kinds of situations, at least the birthing of this parliament on the dawn of January 6th into January 7th, uh, that's the year 2021, we saw what happened there. Sheikh Arimi al Shabo is a member of the National Peace Council and the spokesperson of the National Chief Imam, and he's been talking about what this emergency meeting really achieved. Take a look. Serious anticlimax to our democratic journey. If uh, we really have to see something on power happening uh, tomorrow, because some, some have said it's most likely some military people will be deployed. We don't have the basis for it. But once it's been put out there, we must prepare ourselves for what, what can, can happen. So the advice I can give is the, the trial, the, that is the, the various uh, arms of government, need to remove sentiment and, and see what is happening now as a certain opportunity to understand that certain changes uh, could come at any time uh, and we can look at opportunity to really improve, you know, our democratic journey. It's not so much about this party or that party, but where we have reached means that we have hit a certain point in our democratic journey where certain decisions must, must be made. And I think if we can remove political sentiment and look at this as an opportunity to uh, make a certain change for the better of our future. Also, Sheikh Arimi Al Shaibo, there is a spokesperson of the National Chief Imam, also a member of the National Peace Council uh, there. And ahead of Parliament's reconvening tomorrow, Tuesday, October 22, there's been mounting you know, those concerns. And, and we're live there, and we've been gauging the mood right from afternoon through to tomorrow morning. And, and as of this evening, just about an hour ago, what you're seeing right now, is how Parliament looks like. And bear in mind that because the Chamber of Parliament is 
undergoing some renovation. Parliament has been sitting from the Accra International Conference Centre. Uh, that is the, one of the tents located at the Accra International Conference Centre. That's where Parliament has been set up now um, since the reconvene and since this, uh, the chamber itself has been under some renovation. That's what we're seeing now. This is how Parliament looks like ahead of tomorrow already. Uh, other papers put on all these, uh, the chairs that the MPs 271 or 275, depending on which side of the pendulum that you want to swing to, are looking, as you see right there, the other paper that clearly dictates, and then also the order of business, they all put on their tables, Gavin Swami Agoja, you see there as well, one of the leaders on the NDC caucus, Ibrahim Ahmed, uh, also you see all their names in there, Frank Anodompre, and Salma Deidre, Member of Parliament. So uh, they have just their constituencies captured in there, Patricia P.A.J. Dasukwa, Member of Parliament, um, also one of the leaders of the MP MPP caucus in Parliament, Alessandra Fenyomakin, oh, the only thing written on his name there is the Efutu MP, Efutu MP as you see there. So this is how Parliament looks like this evening, ahead of tomorrow. And already preparations have been put in place ahead of the parliamentary sitting tomorrow. And we are going to be live here on TV3 and Onia TV, Onia FM, 3FM, 92.7, TV3, Ghana on Facebook, Connect FM, Akuma FM, we're all going to be live there from 7 a.m. tomorrow, giving you intermittent reports through to when the sitting starts, all things being equal, at about 10 a.m. We're live there here on your election command center. So stay with us. We're there on the early bed till Parliament's sitting tomorrow ends on your election command center. Give you an idea of how the, the night view is ahead of tomorrow. But coming up next, after this quick break, we'll give you details of the security matters as well because uh, the Ghana Police Service has already put a bounty on the head of the suspect. And this uh, NPP NDC fracas a couple of weeks ago, uh, Fatal Motorway, in connection with that recent disturbances at Mamobi. Now, we'll tell you exactly why the dynamics of this particular incident to some security analysts is one that will not follow the trend of just enticing people with 20,000 CDs to give information. We're back shortly after this quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. Now, the Ghana Police Service has announced a reward of 20,000 CDs for reliable information that could lead to the arrest of suspect Fatal Motorway. Um, it's the suspect in connection with the recent disturbances at Mamobi, Nima. Uh, some supporters of the MPP and the NDC at this altercation. Gunshots were fired. Fatal Motorway was seen in, in a now viral video brandishing a gun during that altercation between uh, supporters of the MPP and the NDC in Mamobi and has been declared wanted in relation to the disturbances. As you see on the screen there, the police says a reward of 20,000 CDs uh, being offered for anyone who provides credible information leading to his arrest, appealing to the public to support intelligence-led efforts by providing this information. And based on the police's own um, earlier communication, this is the man that we're talking about, the gentleman in dreadlocks uh, with the word weapon um, in his hand. This is him, right? Close shot of him we see there um, as well. So... In fact, there are many who say that th this particular situation is not one that may necessarily have persons who even know him coming out to, to give information. Adib Sani is a, is a security analyst with the Jatike Center for Human Security. He's joining us on Zoom. Adib, uh, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. You, you know the dynamics of this particular area and many other areas. We understand that this, this gentleman is not a stranger. He is he's known in the area. Will 20,000 be enough to, in, in, as it were, have someone who knows him volunteer information to the police service in a closely knitted community 
where he finds himself. Okay. Well, Alfred, interestingly, my PhD thesis um, is uh, the 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 is is on Nima. As a matter of fact, I have followed closely. Uh, happening in the area, including gang violence and all that. I've done a bit of research, and I understand the socioeconomic dynamics of the area who, uh, in my opinion, even 50,000 Ghana cities would not be enough because we have consistently failed to deal with the fundamental issues. What are these? Um, I remember when there was a clash between the Kumoji gangs and the bonbon bon clash, uh, you know, you remember that one that happened about two years or so ago. Um, similarly, these individuals were on police wanted list. They were finally found. I mean, they, they were wanted as if they are terrorists. Okay, they were finally found, and immediately they were they were re re released. And nobody knows what has become of that case today. I spoke with some people in the area who told me, look. That is what the police usually does. They would arrest these individuals, and in less than 24 or 48 hours, they release them, and that's the close of the case, all right? Similarly, it is also very possible that this individual in question would be found, be, be detained for 24 hours, and that would be the end of the case. Because of that, a lot of people in the area seem to have lost trust and confidence in the police. Secondly, some find better protection under the criminal regime or the, the gang um, um, regime in the area than that of state security. Interestingly, because I remember when the violence happened first between the Bong Bong and the Kumoji gangs, I was there with the police team, you know, we went around to seek opinions about what was going on. And the lady spoke to us. When the police left, I still was around. They didn't know I was part of the team. And you wouldn't, you can't imagine the level of rebuke she received from those persons who were there and saw her speak with the police. So it has become a norm. You don't speak with the police. You trust the guns better than you trust the police. And, and that has been the case for some time now. So I am not surprised. He's been a very notorious figure. He's known, I've spoken with people who know him so well, and his character is also known. And I'm not surprised that nobody has really come out with information about his whereabouts because of what has happened in the past. They can't just trust the police. Uh, like it's, it's a very instructive analysis that you, you, you make there because of your knowledge of this Mamobi Nema area. Yes, this gentleman, as you indicated, he is known, he's not a stranger. And you say not even 50,000 CDs would entice anyone to give information about him and his whereabouts. And the police say they are doing intelligence led, you know, uh, information gathering. So if money is not going to do it, what else? As a matter of fact, no amount of money can do it. The police needs to work to improve their image, especially in the jungles. Um, they have to work closely with the community leaders and also ensure that the laws are duly enforced. Because if ABC does it and you don't hold them to account, they are not brought to book for their actions. We he will do it, hoping they will also be left off the hook. And that is the thing. In criminology, it's called rational choice theory. Before anyone perpetrates a crime, he's as human as we are, we are able to juxtapose the risk against the reward factor. So if the reward of you not getting caught outweighs the risk of you getting caught, you would naturally be incentivized into perpetrating the crime. On the other hand, if the risk is more than the reward, you would be deterred from committing the crime in the first place. The residents have just had enough of these groups, and there are a lot of these groups 
who are being taken advantage of by politicians because the the, the saddest bit of it is and anytime I get the opportunity to speak with my people, the last time was at the national mosque. I mean I told them, look, when the politicians are looking for muzzles to go cause trouble, their favorite destination are the dongos. Why does it have to be so? So we need to educate the people to get them to understand that it doesn't benefit anyone, neither themselves nor their families, to be used by politicians to perpetrate crimes, especially as we go into these elections. And mind you, a lot of these guys are armed. Where do they get these weapons from? And obviously, these weapons are not even registered in the first place. So we need to be very careful. Because if a health work, something as simple as a health work, metamorphosis into such unbridled violence, it, it really sends right. shivers down my spine. Uh, because there was absolutely nothing healthy about the work in the first place. And it begins the question of whether this could possibly be a great uh, result for more, you know, violent um, clashes to happen as we go into the elections. Uh, Adib, I, I do appreciate your expertise on this matter, and I, I thank you so much for letting us understand the architecture of this particular crime that the Ghana Police Service is dealing with right now. Adib Sani is a security analyst joining us here on Ghana tonight. We're going to go for this quick break. We're back. Coming up next, renewed calls for organized labor to resume their nationwide strike. We'll tell you why some want organized labor back on this strike. Stay with us after this quick break. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. Now, uh, one of the civil society organizations uh, championing the fight against illegal mining, popularly known as Galamsey, they want organized labor to resume their initially planned nationwide strike to, to put pressure on government to step up its efforts. And we'll tell you why. Because these demands, the declaration of a state of emergency in line with Section 31, of the 1992 constitution that has not been considered. In fact, not just the CSOs, uh, organized labor as well, demand that a state of emergency be declared on our water bodies and forest cover when it comes to illegal mining. Awala Sewa is the national coordinator of Eco-Conscious Citizens. I will appreciate your time here on Ghana tonight. You, you made this demand, organized labor made this demand of the state of emergency to be declared. The president hasn't considered that. Now, how much of a difference, really, is it going to make, from your view? You can see that things are getting worse. We heard about um, Erastus being attacked by heavily armed uh, illegal miners or their security. I mean, this raises serious security concerns. We have the existential threat we are facing to do with the poisoning of our water bodies. The landscape has been poisoned, so our food is also being poisoned. We have the birth defects, the medical aspects, and so on and so forth. To add to it, you also have security concerns where you have armed men. We don't want Ghana to descend to parts of Latin America where, you know, the, the drug cartels uh, control areas. So we are saying that nip things in the bud, declare a state of emergency, which is necessary before we can start the reclamation, remove all miners and their equipment start the reclamation using the polluter pays principle meaning that when the illegal miners are arrested prosecuted found guilty any assets they have will be sold towards the cost of reclamation which is a very expensive business and then we are also saying that you need to repeal li 2462 which presumably the process has been started but it needs to be expedited and then you really need to be serious about clamping down on illegal miners. When you go there and they run away, you need to seize the equipment, get the owners, and start yeah. holding the owners accountable. I see. There are so many things we can do, but we really need to begin to take robust and, and action. And it's important because... that you make reference to this because in a number of the instances that this renewed fight has seen, we see some of them running away even before the task force sets in. Nobody is arrested. And, and for you, you want this to be one of the major considerations for voters going into this election, that if, the, if there is no considerable victory against this galamse, that should influence citizens' decisions on who to vote for? You know, when, there's, when, when war is declared 
against the country. All political parties come together, put aside their differences. And I'm thinking of the welfare of the country. Actually, there's a declaration of war against Ghana by the environmental terrorists. They've declared war on Ghana. They are poisoning our water bodies. They've poisoned the landscape, the food we eat. Recently, some tubers and plantain were found to contain mercury. We know water is life. They are, they are poisoning our water, which in war times is a war crime. In addition to this, I've already talked about the um, the rise in kidney disease, cancers, neurological challenges, maternal deaths, and so on and so forth. So any person aspiring to political office, if he really cares about Ghanaians and not just about being whether a president or member of parliament for the sake of it, all political parties should come together now and say that let's put Ghana first. In order to put Ghana first, we must declare a state of emergency. Remove right. all miners from our forest reserves and our water bodies. Put I systems see. in place, numbers that uh, communities can call when they find excavators moving towards the forest yeah. reserves or um, and, and, other uh, equipment towards our water bodies. Certainly, and deal with them are, promptly are, are, are and certainly big enough to. Choose. But you want organized labor, Ola, and, and quickly, you want organized labor to re go back and go on this nationwide strike that they never went on. Why is that? According to organized labor, they didn't call it off. According to them, they suspended it. And what we are saying is that you suspended it since the suspension. What exactly has happened? We found Erastos being attacked, viciously attacked here in his team. And, and we don't know that anybody has been arrested and is in custody for this uh, cowardly attack. We know that illegal mining is still going on. I can talk about Action Su. The excavators are back on the landscape. According to activists there, they are working and causing um, environmental uh, degradation. It's happening in other parts of the country. So what exactly has been achieved that made um, organized labor suspend their mm -hmm. um, strike? So we are urging them to, re to give government seven days notice to declare a state of emergency, expedite mm -hmm. the revocation of LI-2462, Right. Remove all um, illegal miners. If I all miners from our forest reserves and water bodies, Perfect. have a proper task force where we have their numbers, they can be called. And then any um, district um, head or regional minister, if Galamse or shall I say illegal mining is taking place under your watch, and you're not Love. doing about anything about it, you should be removed. Right I think we should take some of these steps. And I really urge organized labor. Well, I appreciate your time, and, and in fact, point well made there. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. Wolasewa is the National Coordinator of Eco Conscious Citizens, one of the NGOs pushing and leading this fight against illegal mining in this country. But there's some news coming through right now, fresh on the plate, some breaking news right now here on Ghana Tonight. Let, let's put that on the screen. News just coming through right now from Parliament. There's a statement coming through from Parliament with regards to security measures that... Um, are put in place ahead of tomorrow and that's what you see there security measures for proceedings from tuesday october 22 as part of measures put in place to ensure the safety and security of the right honorable speaker mps and staff honorable members are respectfully to take note of the following all mps staff and members of the press will be screened thoroughly before the entry into the chamber b Bodyguards of MPs will not be permitted in the chamber. C. Vehicles will not be allowed to park around the Grand Arena. D. MPs are to be dropped at the designated drop-off zones within the presence of the Accra International Conference Center. E. The Ghana Police Service will provide directions to the designated drop-off zone. F. MPs are requested to wear their parliamentary identification tags. G, access to the chamber will be from 8 a.m. That's 0800 hours. H, the public will not be allowed access to the public gallery until further notice. So, respectfully, counting on the cooperation of all, this is a statement coming through Minutes ago, fresh on the plate, he had it right here on Ghana tonight.
these are the security measures announced by the parliament ahead of tomorrow. All MP staff and members of the press will be screened thoroughly. Bodyguards of the MPs will not be permitted in the chamber. Vehicles will not be allowed to be to park around the Grand Arena. MPs are to be dropped at the designated drop-off zones within the presence of the conference center. Ghana Police Service will provide direction to the designated drop-off zone. MPs are requested to wear their parliamentary identification tags. Access to the chamber from 8 a.m. The public will not be allowed access to the public gallery until further notice. This is a statement that was uh, just coming through, uh, signed um, by Frederick Bauer, retired Deputy Marshal of Parliament, as we see there. Well, that's information coming through right now here on your election command center. So stay with us tomorrow. We'll bring you up to the minute detail of what's going to be happening across all media general platforms. My name is Alfred Okansi. Do have a good night.